Could I call everybody in and have your attention, please? Thanks. Welcome. Uh, we're glad you could join us tonight for this second Athanasius lecture this semester. Uh, we are, have an exciting offering tonight from our friend Palmer Bandy. And yes, good stuff. First, let me open us up in prayer and then I'll introduce Palmer. Father, we thank you for this opportunity tonight to come together and to think about things of you. Uh, we pray that you would guide our thought in those things as we consider particularly what we do when we remember you by the meal that Jesus gave us. Um, we pray that you would guide our thought, give us understanding, open our minds to hear the words uh, that Palmer shares uh, and the, the work that Augustine developed. Help us tonight to see these things, to think these things, and for the very unity that will be talked about to be built and strengthened among us in love and charity. And we pray all these things through your Son and by your Spirit. Amen. So I'll be brief here. Uh, Palmer Bandy uh, has uh, prepared for us a wonderful lecture on Augustine's Eucharistic theology. And Palmer is one of our honors students in our Ancient Christian Studies program, a senior now. Um, he's done a number of things for us along the way and continues to do a number of things. Uh, for Jonathan, he's a research assistant. For me and you, he's a friend and many other things as well. He's in the tutorial that I run right now and consistently produces good work there and has produced a wonderful piece for us tonight to think about. It'll be challenging, I think, and introduce us some new ideas, and Palmer is excited to present those to us. So without ado, I will turn over to Palmer, and he will introduce his talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Dr. Malone. Uh, Dr. Malone was my advisor, so I especially need to thank him for his comments and critiques. Um, of course, whatever weaknesses there are in this are my own. I need to thank Dr. Armstrong, uh, without whom we wouldn't even have the Ancient Christian Studies Honors Program or these Athanasius Lectures, um, and also for his comments and critiques and for encouraging me to pursue Augustinian studies. Uh, there are lots of people that I have to thank, but there are three especially. Dr. Jennifer Mills, who also commented and critiqued on my paper. Thank you, Dr. Mills. I don't know if you were in here. Um, Peter Elliott looked over my paper and gave me some wonderful comments as well. And my beautiful girlfriend, Haley Shear, um, for her patience as I was working through this paper and for her encouragement and comments and critiques as well. So would you pray with me? And then we'll begin. Father, thank you so much for bringing us together tonight to hopefully learn more about you and your plan for us as believers. Um, and I ask that you would open our minds and as Dr. Malone said, that you would guide our thoughts um, in figuring out how to appropriate what St. Augustine has for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Ever since his post in Milan teaching rhetoric, St. Augustine of Hippo has taught countless students, both ancient and modern, in matters of philosophy, historiography, semiotics, politics, and most significantly, theology. Charlemagne had the city of God read to him during his meals. Thomas Aquinas cited the bishop as an authority innumerable times in his Summa Theologica. Luther called Augustine the apostle's interpreter, referring to Paul, of course, in his Heidelberg Disputation. And Calvin intended his reforming theology to be a return to the theology of the Church Fathers, especially to that of St. Augustine. Not only did Charlemagne, Aquinas, Luther, and Calvin turn to Augustine for wisdom, but also numerous contemporary evangelical scholars find his theological and historiographical reflections to be incisive and invaluable, with revitalizing potential for contemporary evangelicalism. Augustine's reflections on doctrines concerning grace and original sin were monumentally formative in determining the shape of future theological discussions. In light of his significant influence as a trustworthy teacher, this essay will turn to St. Augustine for guidance in developing a biblically and theologically sound doctrine of the Eucharist. In short, Augustine teaches that the Eucharist signifies the unified ecclesial body of Christ whose unity is brought about by receiving the Eucharist in faith, 
whereby believers are moved to offer themselves sacrificially unto God by loving him and one another. I will begin with a synopsis of Augustine's Eucharistic theology from Sermon 227, transition into an examination of three conceptual underpinnings relevant to this essay, and then synthesize this information into a coherent reconstruction of St. Augustine's theology of the Eucharist, drawing primarily from City of God 10.6 and Tractates on the Gospel of John, books 26 and 27. Only then will I reflect on certain promises and challenges that Augustine's Eucharistic theology holds for the revitalization of an evangelical theology of the Eucharist. The term Eucharist is a transliteration of the Greek noun eucharistia, which in its verbal form means to express appreciation for benefits or blessings and can be translated as give thanks or express thanks. At the Last Supper, as recorded in Luke 22, we read that Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Consequently, Christian traditions that use the term Eucharist are simply borrowing language directly from the New Testament to name what we more commonly refer to as communion or the Lord's Supper. In my first year at Moody, I knew nothing about Augustine or the early church, and so it was easy for me improperly to impose the unique doctrinal developments of medieval and later Roman Catholic theology onto a major figure such as Augustine. As a novitiate in church history, I naively assumed that Augustine was a Roman Catholic in the contemporary sense. I know, however, that none of you now live in the state of historical ignorance that I once lived in. But because you may not be familiar with Augustine's theology, let me briefly address one potential misconception before we move forward. It may be the case that you associate St. Augustine with Roman Catholicism, and therefore could potentially think that Augustine maintained the doctrine of transubstantiation. But Augustine did not develop, nor did he teach this doctrine. Rather, a ninth century controversy between Pascasius Radbertus and Rotromnus gave rise to Eucharistic terminology that would influence future theological discussions. And it wasn't until the Fourth Lateran Council in 1215 that the term transubstantiation was codified into the creedal language of the church. Furthermore, only in the 13th century did Thomas Aquinas tie transubstantiation to the uniquely Aristotelian distinctions between substance and accidents now associated with this doctrine. So whatever Augustine says about the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist, he did not utilize the word transubstantiation or Aristotelian categories in his Eucharistic theology, even though he had mastered Aristotle's categories as a student. I just need to make sure this is working because it'll be very helpful. Augustine says notoriously little about the Eucharist compared to his discussion of other theological themes. He left us with no doctrinal treatise that systematically spells out his theology of the Eucharist. However, he is not completely silent on the matter. St. Augustine left behind a literary corpus of nearly five million words, many of which have been received as transcripts of his sermons. It is well established that Augustine preached impromptu without any notes except mental ones from his preparatory study of God's word. Multiple stenographers would hurriedly pin down his exposition of scripture in shorthand and later transcribe it to longhand. We will begin this study then by surveying one of his sermons for a synopsis of his Eucharistic theology. Somewhere around 414 to 415, Augustine preached a sermon to newly baptized believers on Easter Day in which he explains to them the mystery of the Eucharist, calling it the sacrament of the Lord's table. The term translated as sacrament comes from the Latin word sacramentum, which was what the old Latin scriptures in Africa used to translate the New Testament Greek term musterion, meaning secret, secret rite or mystery. The Apostle Paul uses the, this word consistently in his writings, prompting Augustine to think of the language of sacrament as biblical. While Augustine developed a specific definition of this word, it is important to recognize that, strictly speaking, 
Sacrament is scriptural language. Augustine explained to the new believers that there was a distinction between what was seen on the altar, the bread and wine, and what the elements represented. By the sanctifying word of God, the elements became the body and the blood of Christ. And it was through the bread and wine that Christ presented his sacrificial body and blood shed for our sake for the forgiveness of sins. Augustine explains to his congregation, that bread, which you can see on the altar, sanctified by the word of God, is the body of Christ. And one second, for some reason this isn't working very well. That cup, or rather what the cup contains, sanctified by the word of God, is the blood of Christ. Following this, he says something perplexing. If you receive them well, you are yourselves what you receive. He then immediately quotes Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. Quote, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread. Using an illustration of how bread begins as many grains of wheat, but is eventually baked into one unified loaf of bread through the process of combining multiple ingredients together, Augustine explains to his congregants that when the Holy Spirit was given them in salvation through the sacrament of baptism, they were baked into the bread, which is the body of Christ. He further describes the Eucharist as the sacrifice of God and the Eucharistic elements as great sacraments and signs. This sermon is representative of Augustine's conception of the Eucharist, and especially his use of the terms sacrament, sacrifice, and body of Christ. It is therefore essential to understand the theology underlying these terms in order to comprehend his doctrine of the Eucharist. Augustine consistently identifies the Eucharist as a sacrament, using terminology implicit in the definition of a sacrament to expound his theology of the Eucharist. As a sacrament, it is also the sacrifice of God, and by partaking of it, believers become what they receive, that is, the body of Christ. The following section, then, will briefly explore Augustine's definitions of sacrament and sacrifice, followed by a brief analysis of a pivotal aspect of his ecclesiology, the totus Christus, which translated means the whole Christ. In 408, Augustine preached a sermon on the Eucharist where he says the following with reference to the Eucharistic elements. The reason these things, brothers and sisters, are called sacraments is that in them one thing is seen, another is to be understood. What can be seen has a bodily appearance. What is to be understood provides spiritual fruit. We have already heard him speak of the elements as sacraments, using terminology that distinguishes between sensory experience and spiritual reality. That bread, which you can see on the altar, is the body of Christ. What you can see passes away, but the invisible reality, signified, does not pass away, but remains. What is signified will remain eternally, although the thing that signifies it seems to pass away. These distinctions between what is visible and invisible, apparent to the eyes but signifying something greater, the invisible reality, is rooted in Augustine's theory of signs, known technically as semiotics. We should note that Augustine's semiotics and his definition of sacraments are not synonymous. It would be more accurate to say that sacraments are a subcategory of his theory of signs. Almost anything can be a sign for Augustine, but not everything is a sacrament. There are two kinds of signs, natural and conventional. Smoke is a natural sign because it signifies fire. It is natural because it bears no intention within itself to signify anything, but it is a sign because it does in fact signify something. On the other hand, a conventional sign is one that bears intention. Augustine explains, Conventional or given signs are those which living creatures give one another in order to show, as far as they can, their moods and feelings, or to indicate whatever it may be they have sensed or understood. A military flag may signify advance or retreat, but it only signifies this because it was given this meaning by human beings. In the same way, language is a conventional sign in that it signifies meaning that is given to it and understood by a common group of people who share the ability to interpret its meaning. 
Scripture itself consists of signs that signify meaning. Since scripture is God's revelation to man of his economy and essence, manifested in the human convention of language, which is the best and primary means of transferring meaning between humans. As God is the ultimate author of scripture, and he is eternal and immutable, the revelation itself is definite and unchanging, despite the evolutionary nature of language. According to Augustine, a sacrament is a sacred sign. Because a sacrament is defined as a sign, he speaks of sacraments as visible signs of invisible realities, for a sign is visible, but what it signifies is invisible. In Sermon 272, Augustine explains that things are called sacraments because in them something is seen, but something else is understood. Moreover, for something to be a sacrament, it must bear a resemblance to that which it signifies. The visible sign must correspond to the invisible spiritual reality. In the sacrament of baptism, this correspondence is multifaceted. Water cleanses visibly, just as the Holy Spirit cleanses invisibly. Immersion in water visibly signifies one's death and burial with Christ, which takes place invisibly and spiritually. There is a similarity between the sign and the thing signified. We have so far considered two conditions that constitute a sacrament. It must be a visible sign of an invisible reality, and there must be some sort of similarity between the sign and the thing signified. But there is one further aspect to understand. Consider for a moment the source of our knowledge about the invisible realities that sacraments visibly signify. If there must be a correspondence between the visible sign and the invisible reality, we must first know about the invisible reality in order to determine whether a certain visible sign bears relation to it. So again, what is the source of our knowledge about the invisible realities? It's the word of God. Augustine explains it this way. <clears throat> Excuse me. The word is added to the elemental substance, and it becomes a sacrament, also itself, as it were, a visible word. Speaking of baptism, he writes, <clears throat> What is the baptism of Christ? The bath of water in the word. Take away the water, there is no baptism. Take away the word, there is no baptism. In the same way, bread and wine become sacramental when the word of God is added to them. Without the consecratory words, the bread and wine are merely material elements with no spiritual significance. With the consecratory words, the bread and wine become the body and blood of Christ. How does this take place? Quote, this is brought about by the name of Christ, by the grace of Christ. Consequently, a sacrament is a visible word because the word of God and the visible sign are joined together. As a visible word, the sacrament is only truly received when it is believed. Augustine clearly emphasizes faith as a precondition for the proper reception of a sacrament in his commentary on John 6. By extension, therefore, it is only believers who truly partake of the body and blood of Christ in the Eucharist, while unbelievers eat only the visible sign. Augustine defines sacrament in terms of his theory of signs occasioning a distinction between the visible sign and its invisible reality, as a way of differentiating them from all other signs and indicating their spiritual significance, he called sacraments sacred signs. Furthermore, there must be a correspondence between the visible sign and invisible reality, and the invisible reality is revealed in the word of God. In the case of the Eucharist, the visible sign is the bread and the wine, or juice. But what is the invisible reality that is signified by these elements? Is it the fleshly body of Christ crucified or the heavenly body of Christ ascended? Before attempting to understand Augustine, let us turn to his theological definition of sacrifice. Although Augustine addresses the meaning of sacrifice in numerous places in his corpus, his considerations in the 10th book of the City of God are sufficiently comprehensive and clear to serve as the primary basis for the present section. 
Augustine begins Book 10 of the City of God by reflecting on the source of and means to attain happiness, determining that these things must consist in clinging with all the purity of a chaste love to the one supreme good, which is the immutable God. Clinging to God, what the Platonists termed participation, is the telos, that is, the end or goal, appointed by God who is the true fountain of happiness. This clinging to God, the result of which is true happiness, is achieved through our offering of sacrifice to God, whether enacted in certain sacraments or in our very selves. Speaking of the relationship between the sacrifices of the Old Covenant and the New, Augustine writes, their role, that is the role of the Old Covenant sacrifices, was to signify what is now done among us for the purpose of clinging to God and helping our neighbor to the same end. Thus, the offering of sacrifice to God is legitimate practice that brings about communion with God. <clears throat> the use of the word sacrifice as a means to fellowshipping with God may make some Protestants uncomfortable, but Augustine is more congenial when we grasp his actual definition of the word. With the authority of multiple Old Testament texts, Augustine notes a distinction between visible and invisible sacrifice. He justifies this distinction by appealing to Psalm 51, 16 through 17, 50, 12 through 15, and Micah 6, 6 through 8, all of which contrast animal sacrifice and spiritual sacrifice. The psalmist sings, If you had desired sacrifice, I would certainly have given it. You take no delight in burnt offerings. The sacrifice to God is a contrite spirit. A contrite and humbled heart God will not despise. New Testament texts such as Hebrews 13, 16 and Matthew 9, 13 also confirm Augustine's insights. Consequently, he comes to the conclusion that the true sacrifice is every act done in order that we might cling to God in holy fellowship, that is, every act which is referred to the final good in which we can be truly blessed. Augustine then makes a clear distinction between the cultic sacrifices of the Jewish nation and the spiritual sacrifices of the Christians, alleviating the concerns of those who might be suspicious of his conception of sacrifice. Augustine certainly does not devalue the unique sacrifice of the Word made flesh on the cross, but rather affirms that it is with the Father's only begotten Son as our priest that we propitiate him. Underlying this identification of the Son of God as our priest is a robust Christology that makes it supremely evident that Augustine would never even consider the thought that mankind could appease God without a mediator and that this mediator must necessarily be the God-man, Jesus Christ. It would be the height of absurdity for the mature Augustine to maintain such a conception, and Augustine is anything but absurd. Thus, because Jesus Christ is our priest, Augustine is able to proclaim, To God we sacrifice bleeding victims when we fight for his truth. We honor him with the sweetest incense when, in his sight, we burn with devout and holy love. In order to see him as he can be seen and to cling to him, we are cleansed of every stain of sin and evil desire and are consecrated in his name for he is the source of our happiness, and he is the end of all desire. These spiritual sacrifices are true sacrifices, and they are done in order that we might cling to God in holy fellowship. Fuller participation in God's Trinitarian life is the ultimate goal of spiritual sacrifice. In sum, the offering of spiritual sacrifice is part of our sanctification and is the means by which we love and enjoy God. Christ's unique sacrifice on the cross as our high priest is the ground of our ability to offer these sacrifices to God. But how does Augustine's theology of sacrifice connect to his Eucharistic theology? What is the point of this summary in an essay purposing to analyze Augustine's theology of the Eucharist? The connection is more clearly seen with an understanding of Augustine's ecclesiological doctrine of the whole Christ, to which we now turn. 
In his exposition of Psalm 26, Augustine proclaims to his North African congregation, quote, we are Christ, end quote. Although it would be easy to disregard his words by accusing him of sacrilege, we would do better to seek out the true meaning of Augustine's bold pronouncement. It is important to understand that Augustine recognized something analogous between, on the one hand, the hypostatic union of Christ, that he is one person with two natures, divine and human, and the body of Christ, on the other hand, an ecclesiological metaphor found so frequently in scripture. In broader terms, his Christology informs his ecclesiology. Christ's divinity and humanity are perfectly united in his one person, and it is only because the second person of the Trinity assumed a true human body that he can serve as mediator between God and man. As Augustine writes, there is a separating medium, and on the other hand, there is a reconciling mediator. The separating medium is sin. The reconciling mediator is the Lord Jesus Christ. Here he cites 1 Timothy 2.5. For there is one God and mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, and then continues, saying, to take then away the separating wall, which is sin, that mediator has come, and the priest has himself become the sacrifice, for he came in the flesh, but not in sinful flesh. In other words, the word's assumption of sinless flesh uniquely spans the indissoluble chasm between creator and creature. Christ's incarnation was a necessary condition for the possibility of reconciliation between God and man. And this reconciliation is man united with God through faith. Coming in the likeness of sinful flesh, Christ offered humanity the possibility of incorporation into his body, the church, his sinless flesh serving as the point of contact of the divinity with the church. Christ's human body is both divine and human, and this hypostatic union for Augustine analogously pertains to the ecclesial body of Christ. Thus, as Joseph Carolla notes, to partake of his humanity through incorporation into Christ's body is to share in his divinity, since the two natures are inseparably united in his one person. What Christ is by nature, that is, the Son of God, Man becomes by adoption, that is, a son of God, through membership in his body. Christ's humanity, therefore, enables mankind to become one with him, and this union of believers with Christ is described in metaphorical terms as a body, the church. Since Christ is the head of his church, as Paul teaches in Colossians 1.18, Ephesians 5.23, and elsewhere, the ecclesial body of Christ is Christ in some sense for a living head is intimately joined with a body. Augustine explicitly makes this connection in numerous places. For example, in his commentary on Psalm 59, he says, We should not think of Christ, our head, in isolation. We must think of him as head and body, one whole perfect man. For to us, the Apostle Paul says, You are Christ's body and his limbs. And of Christ himself, the same apostle declares that he is the church's head. But if he is the head and we are the body, the whole Christ consists of head and body. Augustine is not collapsing the distinction between the unique person of Christ and the ecclesial body of Christ by calling Christ and his body the whole Christ or one whole perfect man. On the one hand, Christ's divinity and humanity are united in one person, the hypostatic union. On the other hand, Augustine grounds the unity of the whole Christ, Christ the head and body, in a shared humanity and thus by nature. Accordingly, Christ remains distinct from the church in his person, but he is united to his church through a similarity of nature. Joseph Carolla writes, the person of the incarnate word unites with the ecclesial collectivity of human person by means of the common humanity in its regenerated form to form the whole Christ. He is fully human, just as we are human, and this is where Augustine locates the unity of the whole Christ. Just as a body consists of many members but is one, so also we are united in Christ and with one another. 
In speaking of the whole Christ, Augustine teaches us that the church, which is so often called the body of Christ in scripture, is intimately united with Christ, her head, to such a degree that we may speak of the two as one, the whole Christ, head and body. Remember that Saul was persecuting the church when Christ spoke to him on the road to Damascus. Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Yet Augustine maintains the necessary distinction between Christ the Creator and the creaturely church by identifying this unity in the human nature that Christ shares with us. Experience herself provides ample proof that Christians do not automatically or easily bind themselves to one another and to Christ, regardless of the fact that we are one in Christ and with one another. It may be helpful to consider the difference between an ideal and its corresponding reality. An ideal is something perfect and desirable, but the reality always falls short of the ideal. Ideals are necessary, though, if we are ever to aspire to a greater condition. In the case of the body of Christ, one important modification must apply to the conventional notion of an ideal. Spiritually, we are one body of Christ in holiness, though visibly and historically we are still on our pilgrimage. So what is our ideal? To be what we are, the whole Christ united to one another in love and clinging to our Father through Christ, our high priest who gave himself as a sacrifice on our behalf. What is our reality? Often it is dissension, distrust, discord. Where do we receive the nourishment of charity leading to unity? According to Augustine, in the Eucharist. In short, Augustine teaches that the Eucharist signifies the unified ecclesial body of Christ, whose unity is brought about by receiving the Eucharist in faith, whereby believers are moved to offer themselves sacrificially unto God by loving him and one another. As a sacrament, the Eucharist consists of the visible elements and an invisible reality. <clears throat> Thus, Augustine says to the neophytes of his North African congregation, What you can see is bread and a cup. That's what even your eyes tell you. But as for what your faith asks to be instructed about, the bread is the body of Christ, the cup the blood of Christ. Augustine explains that the bread represents the body of Christ, and the cup represents the blood of Christ, just as the Synoptic Gospels in 1 Corinthians 11:23 through 25 teach. He immediately acknowledges, however, that he has not yet truly instructed them in the actual meaning of this sacrament. Some of them, he writes, may understand him to be speaking of the body and blood of the man Jesus Christ, who resurrected and ascended into heaven in the same flesh that he assumed in the incarnation. And so they might ask, how can bread be his body? And the cup, or what the cup contains, how can it be his blood? In fact, this seems to be the nature of subsequent questions in the ongoing theological conversation concerning the mode or reality of Christ's presence in the Lord's Supper. Augustine addresses this question in his commentary on John 651. Christ says in this passage, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. He goes on, the bread which I shall give is my flesh for the life of the world. Listen to what Augustine preaches concerning this. My flesh, Christ says, <clears throat> is for the life of the world. The faithful know the body of Christ if they do not neglect to be the body of Christ. Only the body of Christ lives by the Spirit of Christ. So then, do you also wish to draw life from the Spirit of Christ? Be in the body of Christ. This is a crucial moment. What is the mode of Christ's presence in the bread? Augustine's thought has shifted from the flesh of Christ to the ecclesial body of Christ. He offers no explanation in this moment for seamlessly transitioning from Christ's proclamation that the bread which he shall give is his flesh to the conclusion that only the body of Christ lives by the spirit of Christ. Isn't this where we would expect Augustine to say, see how Christ explains that the bread of life is his flesh. This bread is the sacrament of the body and blood of Christ. It is Christ himself whom we receive 
when we partake of the sacrament in faith. Instead, he completes the analogy by connecting the dots of canonical scripture. One, Christ is the living bread. Two, the bread is Christ's flesh. And three, quote, we who are many are one body, for we all partake of the one bread, citing Paul in 1 Corinthians 10, 17. How is Christ present in the Eucharistic elements? It is the ecclesial body, the whole Christ, head and body. It is the church united to her head, the man Christ Jesus, into whose body all true believers are incorporated. Speaking with reference to Augustine's Eucharistic theology, Alasdair Heron explains in his book, Table and Tradition, that Augustine, quote, separates out two senses in which Christ might be recognized and received in the invisible reality of the sacrament, and holds that only one of these two senses is applicable. As proof of this, he cites Augustine's words in Tractates on the Gospel of John 50.13, where Augustine makes a distinction between Christ's majesty, providence, his ineffable and invisible grace, and the flesh he assumed as the word. Yet no mention is made of Augustine's explanation earlier in the Tractates that Christ's flesh, received in the Eucharist, is the ecclesial body of Christ as various other scholars have aptly noted. Thus, Augustine can say to his congregation, what you receive is what you yourselves are, because the Eucharist signifies this ecclesial body of Christ. Augustine's reflections on sacrifice and his doctrine of the whole Christ are both vital for a proper understanding of his Eucharistic theology. In City of God, 10.6, he writes, this is the sacrifice of Christians, although many, one body in Christ. And this is the sacrifice that the church continually celebrates in the sacrament of the altar, where it is made plain to her that in the offering she makes, she herself is offered. Reflecting on this passage, Gerald Bonner notes that in order for the church to be both offerer and offering, Christ himself must also be the one who offers and the one who is offered. And indeed, this is precisely what Augustine teaches in City of God, 1020, where he says, In the form of God, then, the true mediator receives sacrifice together with the Father, with whom he is one God. In the form of a servant, however, he chose to be a sacrifice rather than to receive sacrifice, and he wanted the sacrifice offered by the church to be a daily sacrament of his sacrifice in which the church, since it is the body of which he is the head, learns to offer its very self through him. It is the whole Christ, the church consisting of Christ, the head and body, who offers herself to God. The sacrifice that is offered, the invisible reality, is the body of Christ. Through incorporation into the body of Christ, one is united with the mediator, who offered himself as a sacrifice to the Father in order that those who believe might corporately offer themselves as a spiritual sacrifice unto the Father. John C. Cavadini sees in these and other passages in City of God, quote, some kind of sacramental causation. But he acknowledges that Augustine offers no explanation for how it takes place. Writing on the significance of the preposition in for the latter passage, Cavadini says, the church is shown that she herself is offered in what she is offering, and in that offering, the unity of the church is effected. Accordingly, the efficacy of the Eucharist is, for Cavadini, directly connected to its nature as a sacrifice. Although it is difficult to explain in any precise way the efficacy of the Eucharist, Cavadini helps us put words to what takes place in the Eucharistic celebration. Augustine sees the Eucharist as a memorial and a participation in the sacrifice of Christ. Consequently, the body of Christ is formed through and in the Eucharist, enabling the members of the body of Christ to participate in the true sacrifice of Christ through faith. This participation in Christ's sacrifice is lived out or actualized in the members' sacrifice of themselves unto God by loving him and one another. Accordingly, the Eucharist does not afford precisely an encounter with Christ 
as in the case of Ambrose's teaching, but a deepening of one's being in Christ. As believers partake of the Eucharist in faith, Christ brings about a fuller and richer participation in the body of Christ. Augustine seems to imply elsewhere that the Eucharist is somehow efficacious, for when it's eaten, it nourishes the spirit. In fact, Augustine speaks even more strongly about the efficacy and necessity of the Eucharist in his tractates on the Gospel of John. Eternal life is what is missed by the one who does not eat this bread or drink this blood. And if you do not take it, you do not have life. Moreover, the reality itself of which this is the sacrament means life for all, ruin for none. And what again is the reality itself? It is the body of Christ. Augustine teaches, by this food and drink, Christ wishes that the fellowship of his body and of his members be grasped. That fellowship is the holy church and his saints and his faithful, who have been predestined and called and justified and glorified. J. Patu Burns makes clear that when Augustine exhorted his congregation to become and to be what they received, the body of Christ, his reference was a spiritual union of Christians in Christ by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit of Christ enlivens the body of Christ, for it is through the Spirit of Christ that we share in the one who is eternal life. Augustine says the whole purpose of participation in the Eucharistic rite is for us to abide in him and him in us. But he continues, now we abide in him when we are his members, while he abides in us when we are his temple. But for us to be his members, we have to be bonded together by unity. Thus, unity is an essential component in the constitu constitution of the body of Christ, achieved through charity, which comes from the Holy Spirit, according to Romans 5.5. 5. Therefore, Augustine writes, it is the Spirit who makes sure the members are alive. There is nothing, after all, that Christians should be more afraid of than being separated from the body of Christ. For if they are not his members, they are not being kept alive by his spirit. Unity with the body of Christ is unity with Christ, <clears throat> since the whole Christ is head and body. And just as a human body lives by its spirit, so also the ecclesial body, the whole Christ, lives by the spirit of Christ. St. Augustine's Eucharistic theology is either ingeniously complex or frustratingly ambiguous. Following many Augustinian scholars, I am inclined to believe the former. In the explanation above, I have attempted to systematically identify and trace the connections between important aspects of his theology of the Eucharist. What remains is for me to reflect on certain promises and challenges for an evangelical retrieval. Let me begin with one of the challenges and then move on to two promises. It is clear that the Eucharist signifies the unity of the church, but in thinking about Christian unity, we are pressed to reflect on the nature of the church. Where is the church? What constitutes the true church? During Augustine's time, the Donatists were a schismatic group claiming to be the true church, but they rejected what Augustine considered to be the true church on the grounds of its impure ministers, ordaining their own clergy and baptizing people into their sect. Augustine was in many ways quite gracious towards them, but he could not accept their disunity from the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Even here, though, we have not yet answered any of the above questions, for the problem remains. What is the one holy Catholic and apostolic church for Augustine? Did he conceive of apostolicity as communion with the Bishop of Rome? <clears throat> if so, can we actually appropriate his Eucharistic theology with its emphasis on unity in the body of Christ? Because would that not mean that we must return to Rome in order to fulfill Augustine's vision of true unity? It is not crystal clear, however, that Episcopal connection to the Roman Church was fundamental to Augustine's ecclesiology. In the case of the Donatists, it seems that he chided their lack of charity, more so than their institutional separation. So what would Augustine say is taking place when I receive the Eucharist in my local church? 
One of the promises of Augustine's Eucharistic theology, on the other hand, is that it identifies the ultimate purpose of the Eucharist, the unity of the body of Christ through charity. Many of, this, many of us in this room are influenced by Ulrich Zwingli's memorialism. Hermann Bovink explains that for Zwingli, to eat Christ's body and drink his blood is nothing else and nothing more than to believe in Christ as the crucified one, appropriating the merits obtained by Christ on the cross. We need not depart from Zwingli's conviction that in the Eucharist we do remember Christ's sacrifice on our behalf. No Orthodox Christian tradition would disagree with this statement. The problem, I think, is that he doesn't say enough. Augustine offers something more. Not only do we remember that sacrifice, we also participate in that sacrifice by loving our brothers and sisters in Christ, thereby recognizing that Christ's unique sacrifice is intended to bring about in those who believe a response of spiritual sacrifice. Furthermore, in our reception of the ecclesial body of Christ through the Eucharist, we are given the Spirit who enlivens the invisible body of Christ. Indeed, for Augustine, the Eucharist is a God-ordained means whereby the spiritual reality of our unity as members of the body of Christ is increasingly brought to bear on those who receive it in faith. Some of us may be wary of assigning any causal function to the Eucharist. How can bread and wine of themselves do anything for us? But this would be to misunderstand Augustine. For the bread and wine are merely material elements without the word of God. If anything is brought to bear through the Eucharist, it is Christ working through the Holy Spirit in his ecclesial body. In more familiar terms, the Eucharist is an important aspect of our sanctification, actualizing, as it were, the reality of who we are in Christ, one whole perfect man. Do we not already believe that sanctification is ultimately dependent upon God's activity in our lives? Does Paul not say in Philippians 2, 12 through 13, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. If Augustine is right that Christ works through the Eucharist to bring about unity through charity and his body, it ought to hold a much more prominent place in the life of the evangelical church. Augustine's Eucharistic theology is a beautiful reminder of the importance of charity leading to unity in the church. We see his passion for the body of Christ and his acute focus on love as the principle by which we live in harmony with one another and cling to God. This love does not come from within ourselves, but comes through the Holy Spirit who enlivens the body of Christ enabling her members to sacrifice their own desires for the sake of fellowship with one another and God. St. Augustine would have us believe that in the Eucharist, we truly receive the ecclesial body of Christ that lives by the Spirit of Christ. Well, thank you very much, Palmer, for that wonderful delivery and well-researched paper. What we'll do now is take just a break for about 10 minutes until 8 o'clock, and then we'll come back together for some responses and questions from you as well. So take a break until 8 o'clock and come back in here. All right, as you're grabbing your seats, uh, first I'd like to thank Palmer for a fine paper. Um, Palmer, I think you showed a real sensitivity to history, uh, real conceptual clarity in what you wrote, and a deeply Christian interest in listening to the past for modern theological retrieval. And um, Dr. Armstrong and I are both ex really excited about those questions you've raised. So great job. I think the students as well will be very interested in talking about those things. Um, Dr. Armstrong and I are serving as the sole panelists tonight. Not for lack of trying, we thought we might have a third, but it didn't work out. Um, so in light of that, we've done something a little different. We both prepared a few remarks, interacting with what you've written, 
raising a few uh, questions and sketching, at least I will sketch some trajectories forward from what you suggest suggested and see what you think about those, the kind of dialogue with what Augustine does and maybe take up the mantle you suggested of, can we do anything with this? Um, so that's what I'll turn to. So here's what, I've, here's what I've got and then Dr. Armstrong will be next. You've sketched out uh, Augustine's Eucharistic theology for us uh, within his own sacramental theology as you said, it's a piece of this, and it fits within a fairly larger sacramental structure that patristic scholars, um, like Lewis Ayers, have noted uh, was fairly well established by Augustine's time. Augustine adds some distinctive features, though, which you flagged up really helpfully. Um, his semiotics, broadly his theory of signs, of which a sacrament is a specific kind of sign, and his notion of the totus Christus, or the whole Christ, for the Eucharist itself, Augustine is really distinctive here, it seems like, like you said, in the way he develops the whole Christ, essentially tracing how the eternal son, um, complete in himself, is chosen to be complete with the human nature here, he assumed, and he's now chosen to be complete with his body, the church. Um, I take that to be the, the doctrine, as Augustine expresses it. Uh, and the way that relationship works allows Augustine, then, to describe a really complex relationship between the body, the church, and uh, it strain, as it strains for its head, Christ, and constantly follows him and constantly becomes more and more incorporated into it. Something like that, I think. Because of that, again, just to summarize a little more, uh, Augustine can say Christ offers himself in the Eucharist, and so also the church is offered as well. Um, this is a really unique contribution of Augustine to develop this out for us. You connected then the notion of sacrament and the whole Christ uh, with the notion of, of sacrifice, specifically focusing on spiritual sacrifice. Um, and notions of sacrifice, of course, become really important in discussions in the Eucharist later um, in the church, um, particularly in Roman um, discussions on that in a Protestantly troublesome way. But you seem to think uh, that Augustine doesn't play on those notions, perhaps with the exact same specificity. And I'm inclined to think you might be right there. Um, that, the, that, that actually Augustine isn't perhaps going that way either. So I'll, I'll save that uh, for a minute. If I could offer maybe then my summary too of what I'm, what I'm hearing you say and then interact with that of Augustine's Eucharistic theology. The Eucharist, it seems like for Augustine, transforms Christians, builds the church in unity and love, and makes Christ present through liturgical action. I mean, those, those are the things I hear you saying. Um, builds individual and transforms Christians, builds the church in unity and love, and then makes Christ present through liturgical action. You can tell me if I got that right later, but I, th I think that's, that's maybe a fair summary. Um, in appreciation of that, let me then try to address some of the questions you said and, and give a little uptake of this. All your questions, uh, I think, revolved around how evangelicals might learn from Augustine. And as you use the term evangelical, I take it to mean a subspecies of Protestants that we are, um, and I'll submit uh, within Protestantism, we actually have a pretty rich vein of theology in the classical reform tradition um, as opposed to the sort of Anabaptist tradition, um, which we might connect with most, if not all the benefits Augustine offers. Let me suggest that and question if our evangelical subculture has actually heard that, um, and you tell me if it actually connects. So let me just summarize that briefly. I'll put on my reformed hat for a second. I'm not sure I ever took it off. Um, for Protestants, um, it's only this authoritative scripture that can actually tell you uh, what a sacrament is, because um, it comes from divine mandate, and that's where they believe they hear that. And for the Reformed, a sacrament is something that had to be instituted by Jesus and must be commanded to all Christians. Um, and that's pretty consistent. They keep saying that. Um, and that limits the sacramental discussion to baptism and Eucharist and guides the Reformed understanding for both. So they say things like this, the Heidelberg Catechism, um, relays this, question 77, where has Christ's promise that he will feed and nourish believers with his body and blood just as surely as they eat of this broken bread and drink this cup? It's question 77 from Heidelberg. And the answer is, in the institution of the Holy Supper. Um, and then they go on to cite 1 Corinthians, 7, uh, 1 Corinthians 11 and then finish the statement with this. When we break the bread, is it not a means of sharing the body of Christ? Because there is one loaf, we are many as we are, but we are one, for we are one body. For there is one loaf of which we all partake. It's a really interesting answer, um, and it sounds shockingly Augustinian um, in some ways, doesn't it? The Eucharist is a means of making Christ present through liturgical action, just like Augustine, 
more so the Eucharist is said to have a communal component, the sh quote, again, the share of the body of Christ. Many as we are, we are one body. That's, that's the statements they're using. And that, again, sounds strikingly close to Augustine's articulation of some aspect of the totus Christus, uh, envisioning the church being built by means of sharing and, and partaking. Um, it's the language they're using again there. It's interesting. So it seems like, again, in that, in that strain of the tradition, we've taken up precisely what Augustine offers and in some very specific terms. On the language of sacrifice, again, really interesting, John Calvin, I think, makes a pretty similar distinction to the one you gestured toward, although he uses some different terms. Calvin says there's two kinds of sacrifice you can think about. Um, he doesn't say spiritual and material, per se, right? He says expiation, a sacrifice for cleansing and pardon, by which he's probably thinking of the actual sacrifices and Jesus as himself. And he says sacrifices of praise and adoration and thanksgiving would be the, the other kind of, of sacrifice. Todd Billings highlights this and says uh, it's actually the difference between justification in Christ for the reformed and sanctification by the Spirit. The nature of the second grace, sanctification, is actually gratitude, praise, and thanksgiving made possible by the first grace, uh, justification, a free pardon. They seem to be mapping some similar kinds of distinctions with particularly Protestant language. Um, and so sacrifice involved in the Eucharist for the Protestants is a part of sanctification, the exact same language you used, but not expiation, but rather gratitude, praise, and thanksgiving. Again, I, I think you said something similar, but I'm now using the Protestant particular words that are used here. Um, further, the Reformed explain the symbolism of the Eucharist in a way they've resourced from Augustine. They say these are holy signs which cannot be directly identified with the reality they signify. So they use indirect signification, um, which is, again, precisely what they borrowed from Augustine here. Um, that is, the signs draw us into realities they signify while remaining created elements, and they, they keep insisting this. Or put differently, material things, created things, draw us into spiritual reality. Um, what does that mean? Again, Calvin describes the Eucharist as the means by which Christ and the believer commune in the spirit. Um, again, very Trinitarian, very similar to some of the things Augustine said. How is that so? The sacramental sign, the elements, have a union with the substance of the sacrament, with Christ, and as such, the substance must always be distinguished from the sign that we might not transfer the one to the other. And Calvin argued that fellowship occurs when the spirit draws the believer into the local presence of Christ located in the heavenly places. And he thought that was happening through the supper. You were being drawn into Christ and then thus drawn into each other. Um, so the sacrament, for, too, for the Reformed here is not only a reminder of Christ's past presence or even of his current presence that's separated from the sacrament. Instead, the sacrament is an occasion for the contemporaneous presence of the risen Christ to be made manifest. Hey. Similar kind of thinking there, it seems like. Calvin has just kind of spelled it out in Trinitarian terms as he understands it. Finally, it might be further described um, to say the sacraments for the Reformed are a means of grace. So this is the language they, they use, too, that tracks with a lot of what I think Augustine was talking about. Not that they justify, but that they sanctify. Again, finally, the Catechism from Heidelberg again, question 66. What are sacraments? They are visible and holy signs and seals instituted by God, so that by our use of them, he might make us understand the promise of the gospel better and seal it. The promise of the gospel is that because Christ's one sacrifice finished on the cross, he will grant us grace, forgiveness of sins, and eternal life. Again, some very parallel language, actually, to Augustine there. Um, they make us understand and they seal us. How so? Well, they actually call these visible words, um, which they seal from Augustine as well. Um, efficacious words by the Spirit's power through created things. Um, I believe that sketch, um, to me, demonstrates Reformed Protestants have taken up most of Augustine's insights here, um, at least that you, you sketched out for us. And I believe perhaps it ans it's one answer. I would like you to respond to it, um, to your concern. A mere memorial might not be enough. Um, they certainly want to say a lot more in this tradition, this Protestant tradition. And it gestures toward a centrality even to this Christian practice, which you also asked at the end. And it also speaks in terms companionable to the totus Christus, um, for sure, too. Um, bound together um, as the one church of Christ in this action. And perhaps maybe the one other question you asked, which church? <laughs> Where is that church? Um, I think they answer the one church of Jesus Christ. 
bound together by the self-organizing power of the gospel, visibly present on every Lord's day, and per Augustine, on page five at least I have written here, or page nine that you had, that unity is actually grounded in Christ's humanity, which is an object of their present faith and their future hope um, and their eschaton, not in an ecclesial order. At least I, that's the way I read what Augustine said there. So that seems pretty companionable with what the Reformed have done. Um, and I'm curious if you think that's enough. Have they taken up what you've asked? Should we turn our eye toward that kind of an appropriation? What say you? To, to all of it. Um, yes, I like all of it. I think, though, that the, the distinctive thing in Augustine is his emphasis on what is received in the Eucharist. And he's, he consistently says, it's the ecclesial body of Christ. It's you yourselves. And so it seems like for him, the totus Christus is actually um, a lot more important to his Eucharistic theology than maybe Calvin or, the Heidel, or Heidelberg um, may make it. Um, so that's my initial answer, and if you keep prodding me, I'll keep answering you. Uh, maybe I could just ask for a clarification. Mm -hmm. um, when you say the totus Christus as the ecclesial body, I mean, I hear language in the Reformed, uh, we're partaking in each other, we're actually being made together, this one bread is one body. Help me understand why that doesn't track with what, Calvin, uh, with what um, Augustine says. It seems like they've actually taken that from him. Yeah, so I guess, so I haven't read enough Reformed theology to know exactly what they're saying. But, so from what you've said, one body, one bread. True, yes, that, that does sound like the totus Christus, but what I don't hear in that is um, a particular explanation of what it means that we're one body, and that it means that we actually also have a head, and that we're intimately united to that head, um, and that that head is Christ. So I think that's the, that's the distinctive in Augustine that I would push for. I mean, I found his totus Christus doctrine to be extremely um, interesting and something that I'd never heard of or thought about, um, but it makes so much sense to me. So that's, that's what I would push on. I think that's, that's where his emphasis is. Yeah, no, that, that's helpful, Palmer. Thanks for that. I, I appreciate the clarification there. Um, I think you'll find that in the tradition, maybe just not treated at that moment in mm -hmm. that question on that confession. But uh, yeah, but, yeah, but cer certainly I, I, hear, I hear the distinction you've made about uh, when they talk about the mediatorial office, actually the threefold office of Christ, you actually get, get quite a bit of language on how that connects to the church as well. But that's very helpful. Thanks for that. Um, I will pass over to Jonathan for the sake of time, actually. Super. And I'll try to keep my comments also very brief because I know you have questions and I want to get them to them. Um, first of all, thank you, Palmer, and thank you for producing what is a very useful lecture. So this, this and one of the reasons why we have to get to your questions is because I do believe this has been uh, tremendously useful. Um, we, we finally have a public lecture that forces us to actually do some theological thinking. And what I mean by that is um, it forces us to grapple with the complexities of framing and seeing all the nuances of this biblical and theological language. Um, so all of these biblical and theological themes are converging uh, in this one single point, and it makes it an, extraordinary, an extraordinarily rich uh, thing for us to survey and to reflect on. So Christ is the head of the body, and uh, if I'm part of that body, then we are also part of Christ. How far can we take this? How can we explore this language? Christ is the bread of life. So then without this bread, we cannot live. But in eating the bread, are we eating Christ's physical body? In fact, how does it mean, are we in fact somehow ingesting ourselves? Or what's happening? So th this language forces us to, to work out those nuances. And in that way, it's extraordinarily theologically fruitful. So this is something that we should all be grappling with. And I know that your responses, the emotional responses that you've had from listening to this will probably be cold or hot. I love this, I hate this. That's good. 
because it's forcing us to actually do some real theology and grapple with that. You're theology students of, of several years. Have you ever wondered to yourselves what theology actually is? Or it's like, what am I missing that I don't know? I can't even define theology. It's probably because you're not doing it, because you're staying too safe. Something like this forces us to do theology. It forces us to, to draw conclusions that we're unsure of, but need to test, find wisdom for. That's actual theology. And if you do that long enough, you'll, you'll know what it is that you're, you're doing. So get your hands dirty, do that. What is the nature of theological language? I think the most problematic part of um, Augustine's Eucharistic theology is the nature of sacrifice. What does it mean that, that cr this that this Eucharist is a sacrifice. That's probably where most of, the, uh, of my concerns would be. I think Protestant the uh, uh, theology has to be right when, at least it's an instinct of Protestant theology, to affirm that Christ um, cannot be physically offered a second time, right? That, 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 input, that uh, burden reflects what the author of Hebrews wants us to remember when in 1010 he says, um, so we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and other passages from Hebrews could be enumerated there too. Whatever else is happening in the Eucharist, Christ is not being physically re-sacrificed. Um, I have talked to enough Catholic theologians that I think what's happening in our differences is one of metaphysics, more, more so than a biblical interpretation. In fact, if I can extrapolate out on that, I don't think it's any coincidence that the Protestant Reformation comes about the same time that our metaphysical foundations really start shifting and moving. It's about the same time as the rise of science. And all of these questions that had been packaged um, neatly in a, in a, meta, in a uh, medieval metaphysical or, or platonic metaphysical garb suddenly are recast in a very different light. And so Protestants start disagreeing with the Catholic Church and even with themselves. Um, what is it that's taking place at this time? It seems um, that the Catholic and Orthodox are retaining this older metaphysic and Protestant theologians stop reflecting, perhaps, systematically on the metaphysical nature of what's taking place in the Eucharist. So we, we, our communities start asking different questions. And when that happens, we start driving in pretty different di directions theologically. But there are, there's a richness to scripture that could be reclaimed here. What does it mean, for example, when Paul in Colossians 1.24 is talking about the sufferings that he's experiencing? and that somehow his sufferings are filling up the sufferings of Christ. What could that possibly mean? If, if we reflect on that and pursue that, we might get closer to what the uh, uh, um, Christians in the, in the Orthodox or uh, Trinit uh, excuse me, um, Catholic uh, fold are thinking. Ultimately, Palmer, let me gently disagree that although I do, you, at the end of your lecture, you say that Augustine's Eucharistic theology is either ingeniously complex or frustratingly ambiguous, and while I do try to attribute genius every possible opportunity I get to Augustine, here I think he's being ambiguous. Perhaps not frustratingly so, perhaps wisely. Augustine wasn't a man to hold back his mind or to not speak his mind. If he wanted to say more, he probably would have. Uh, I, he knew that the editors would pick up the extra volumes in his work. Um, Augustine, I think, has a wisdom here about him when he, when he s leaves off. He knows it's a mystery. It's, isn't that what the word sacrament means? It's, it's Latin for mystery. So isn't it somehow wrong-headed of us to spend all of this time in scientific terms trying to define what this mystery is? Wait a minute. You misunderstood what sacrament is. It's like, um, and, and what, is, what is a mystery even, in, or in this case to use the Latin, what is a sacrament? It's something that probably defies definition because it, it transforms you. And so it can't quite be captured in language. In that, in that sense, I could tap into a very deep tradition and say it's like marriage. It's a mystery that will transform you. What is marriage? It, well, whatever else it is, you won't be the same person when you're done. What will it do to you? You can't quite state it because the you who enters will not be the you who finishes that sentence. So let's call it a mystery. It won't quite be captured in that. And I'm sure the Eucharist is the same thing. What is it? It's, it's a divine mystery. The you who enters that will not be the you who exits. And, and uh, we will be more united to Christ and therefore also to one another. Thanks so much. Shall we go straight to questions from the audience? And I'm, 
Josh, I'll let you lead, but maybe we'll go to here over. I have half a mind to press on one thing you said. Just to put it out there so we can think about it together. So you did problematize things as perhaps there's a breakdown of metaphysics going on around this time, and Protest perhaps hypothetically Protestants kind of lose it. Um, and perhaps Augustine is actually vague on some of this stuff. That's, that's what I heard you, some of the things I heard you saying. Let me completely flip it. Augustine gets it right because he actually realizes the primary union uh, and communion in the Eucharist is always between Christ and the communicants, not between Christ and the elements. And when the conversation changes metaphysically to be about between Christ and the elements, it gets metaphysically weird, strange, develops in odd ways that needs to get taken back to something more like what Augustine did. So I'll, I'll propose the exact opposite um, and say that's why it's actually companionable with, uh, with Protestant theology and Catholic theology goes astray there. invisible realities of the elements that only Christians are truly able to take communion, uh, meaning that unbelievers cannot possibly take communion. Well, then, with the Augustinian theology, that would be That's a great question. Uh, Augustine actually sermon <clears throat> Okay. In one of his sermons on the Eucharist, two twenty seven, two seventy two, one of those, he actually says, um, they're super important uh, sacraments. And how is their importance pressed upon us? Why do we know that they're important? And the answer he, he gives is just that. He, he goes directly to Paul and says, look what Paul says. If you, untake unworthily, if you take unworthily, um, then you're taking to judgment upon yourselves. Um, so he uses that language. and. And he uses that language elsewhere. He says, if, if somebody takes of the material element without faith in the invisible reality, they're taking it to judgment upon themselves. So he, it, it seems what I've read, he just mirrors that language exactly. I hope, is, I hope that's a good answer to your question. I think one other thing that supports Augustine's reading, just to say, say this as well, is the sort of having a sin before your brother there and confessing it. If the Eucharist is actually about ecclesial unity and oneness, then actually if you're drinking toward ecclesial unity and oneness, but actually not living that out and you have things against your brother, you're actually now drinking judgment to yourself rather than demonstrating the unity you're supposed to have. This contextually seems to be a pretty reasonable sort of move on the text um, and fits precisely what he says. Yeah, that's right. So maybe just to kind of sharpen that a bit. Yes, that's very good, because Augustine actually does say exactly that in another one of his sermons. Uh, thank you, Chad. That was an excellent lecture. Thank you. Um, one question that I had, uh, how many sacraments did Augustine believe existed, and did each of them have a specific purpose like the Eucharist did? Good question. Uh, he did not limit it to seven, as the later tradition would, because of his, I, and I think it's because um, he thought of a lot of things as sacraments. Like for example, Easter day is a sacrament. Um, and the reason was, I, I can't actually uh, repeat it to you because I don't know well enough exactly what he was saying, but it was something about the fact that Easter fell on a certain day of the year and there was a certain significance about that day um, that 
aligned it with what actually happened in the past. So he had a, he thought of a lot of things as sacraments. So it, it wasn't limited to seven and, and nobody actually knows exactly how many sacraments he thought of. It, it doesn't seem like it was a formal, he, he formalized that, so. Uh, thank you for such a great lecture. I actually have two questions. The first being, how often did Augustine and the early church participate in the sacraments? Um, and then secondly, what is Augustine's view of the Eucharist and of salvation? For example, what if you're under um, like, um, discipline, for example, and you can't participate for a while, what does that mean for sanctification and salvation? Good, so on the first question, how often? Augustine addresses that explicitly. He says it ought to be taken daily. He says that multiple times. But there was a, a certain bishop, Januarius, I believe he was a bishop, who sent Augustine a letter and asked, one of the questions was, how often should we take the Eucharist? Um, or if I go to a certain church and they take the Eucharist, you know, maybe only once every two weeks, but I usually take it every day, what should I do? And Augustine answers, first of all, do what they do, basically. Just, just do what they do. And he also says, um, secondarily, do it as, as much as you can. Um, so, so he's actually not dogmatic about that. And the reason he's not dogmatic about it is because he explicitly says it's not, it's not said anywhere in scripture how often you should do it. He thinks it ought to be done daily probably because of what it affects, but he's not dogmatic about it at all. He's very gracious about it. Second question, can you remind me really quick? That's a good question. Um, for him, I don't think that he would say that somebody's lost their salvation. I know he wouldn't say that if they um, are not able to partake of the Eucharist. I think what he might do there is say they're in a certain, um, there's a certain period of time where they're undergoing discipline. Um, and while they are penance undergoing discipline, they cannot partake of the Eucharist. Um, and, and that doesn't necessarily exclude them from salvation though. So I, I don't know exactly what he would say is happening there, whether they're losing out on salvation. I, I, I don't think he would say that, but maybe they're losing out on the ideal unity that they're meant to have with the body of Christ. Maybe that's something closer to what he would say. Thank you, Palmer. Um, my question is, um, if you think that there could be one thing that August, Augustine could tell Protestants today and uh, about the Eucharist, about the way we practice it, um, what would that one thing be? That's good. Very open-ended. Um, <laughs> I've got to think about that. I don't know. Like I'm supposed to speak for Augustine. That's a, that's a big responsibility. Um, wow. Maybe, um, I think that he would just go to its ultimate purpose and he would say, recognize what's taking place in the Eucharist. Recognize that this is intended to bring about unity in the body of Christ and it's Christ who's working through it. Um, and maybe you can experience deeper and richer fellowship with both Christ and with your neighbor, with fellow believers, if you were to take this sacrament more seriously. Maybe something like that. Chief, would there be one more question? Hey, Palmer, thank you for the, the great lecture and I apologize for not dressing up. I just came back from work. Um, the question, though, uh, this regards a little bit more um, relating to the priesthood of believers. 
does Augustine anywhere talk about um, if only priests are able to um, perform the Eucharist? And if so, uh, does he say why? That's a wonderful question. Originally, I had intended to do my Athanasius lecture on Augustine's theological justification for making a distinction between clergy and laity. So that's like exactly what I'm interested in. What I realized in starting to write that paper, and actually I wrote a paper, a, a descriptive paper of what he believed. I never got into the actual why question, which I really wanted to, but I realized that there just wasn't, at least in English, that much research that I could uh, find that said anything about the why. It seems like Augustine didn't talk about the why so much. Why can only a, a, a clergy member administer the word and the sacraments? So, so to answer it, yes, he does say that it's only an ordained clergy member who is meant to um, administer the sacraments, baptism, Eucharist, and preach the word. But um, he, he does say that in certain circumstances, um, a, a member of the laity could do it if, if there were no clergy around. Um, but he says that, that so that's probably not going to happen very often. So did that answer your question? Okay, so basically, I don't know why. I can, I can say descriptively, because when somebody is ordained for Augustine, they receive the sacrament of ordination they receive a mark on their soul that marks them as a minister of Christ. And he says in On Baptism Against the Donatists, when you receive the sacrament of ordination, you, res you receive the sacrament of giving baptism. So you're, you're able to, to give baptism once you've been ordained. So he does say, yes, it has to be a clergy member. Well, if we've got time, I'll ask another one. Um, so you stated uh, that we are participating in Christ's suffering by partaking of the Eucharist and by loving God and our neighbor. And Dr. Armstrong, like, mentioned this as an issue. Um, but my question, I guess, would be, what does he mean by suffering, and would that diminish Christ's suffering that took place on the cross, like his physical suffering? I... I think I just said sacrifice. I need to check, but I, yeah. So I th I'm pretty sure that I said sacrifice and, and that that's what Augustine said. And so what he means by that, that we participate in Christ's sacrifice um, is grounded in his distinction between visible and invisible sacrifice. and the way that we participate in Christ's sacrifice is by offering ourselves um, to God by loving one another and loving God. And so any, I mean, any act of mercy, any act of love is a true sacrifice. And in doing so, we are participating in the sacrifice of Christ. And the reason that we can participate in that is because of Christ's unique sacrifice, without which we would not have any sort of access to the Holy Spirit who enables us and enlivens us to love one another. Eucharist relates to that as the visible sign? So the Eucharist relates to, can you spell it out more explicitly? So, so how are those two things related? Sorry, the, the Eucharist and um, us participating in the suffering, or not suffering. Yep. Sacrifice, yes. So I, I see it kind of as a, recipro a reciprocal relationship. So anything that we give to God, we first receive from God. So in the Eucharist, what we receive is the ecclesial body of Christ that lives by the spirit of Christ. And the spirit of Christ enables us to love one another and loving one another is our sacrifice back unto God. And so it's God giving to us and us giving back to him as, as a sacrifice. And that's our participation in Christ's sacrifice.
anymore? Great, wonderful. Uh, please come and ask more questions of Palmer, even harder ones, if you want to after. Um, we really appreciate you being here tonight, you thinking through these big issues, and I assume you will continue to think through them. Thank you very much, and let's give a final thanks to Palmer. Thank you.